change. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yes, there is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Oh, come on, church, let's keep our hands lifted tonight. Surrender yourselves to Him tonight, church. Come on, church, why don't you sing with me? Your sufficient sacrifice. testimony with us and um, we're going to see let it be an encouragement church of what, what's going to be shared here tonight we've got a couple of um, needs we want to lift up here tonight uh, we've got Pastor Ritash uh, down at Prescott uh, for their Bible conference so keep them in your prayers pray that God would yes. um, Come on. Or bring an element into their ministry uh, let's be praying for Pastor um, as he preaches down at um, San Diego this Sunday yes. and be keeping them in your prayers pray that God uh, would equip him I would give him an anointing um, as he prepares to preach down in San Diego. I'll be uh, keeping Pastor Campbell, Campbell's wife um, in your prayers. He's one of our pastors uh, down in America. Uh, his wife uh, has an infection. So uh, let's be praying for Pastor Campbell's wife. I'll be praying for your needs as well. Pray that God would, would speak to you through Jared's testimony. So why don't we do that tonight, church? Let's, let's lift up our hands. Let's pray to God. Let's cry out to him. And I'm going to get my brother Jordan to lead us through prayer. Let's pray, church. God, we thank you tonight that we can come here, God. God, that we can be here in this place, God, with an opportunity to get right with you, God. We pray. Be with us here tonight, God. God, may you have your way. 
Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege, Lord, that we can be saved and born again. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the price you paid upon that cross, Lord. Lord, that you have the power to change lives, God. We're asking and calling upon your name, Lord, that you will pour out your presence, your spirit to be established here tonight, God. Father, we lift up these needs. We pray for our pastor, Adrian, his wife, Tash, there, over in America, Lord. I'm asking you to bring an equipping, Lord, bring a refining in their ministry, Lord, that you would help them, Lord, help pastor as he preaches there in San Diego, Lord. Give him the boldness, Lord. I'm asking God, help us here tonight, Lord. We pray and uplift the man of God, Lord. We pray for our brother Jared, Lord. We pray for the anointing, your favor, Lord. Help him have the courage, Lord, to declare the goodness, God, the mercy that you have, you have made in his life, Lord. Help us to leave it encouraged, Lord, inspired in our hearts, God. Believe in God. You are on the front, Lord. Help us to leave it, Lord, to be doers of your word, God. Have your way, Lord. Raise up disciples in this foundation. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you. And all God's people said tonight. Amen. 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 Church, good to see you tonight. Let's turn and welcome one another tonight. <laughs> Amen. Appreciate your faithfulness to be here tonight, church. Uh, we've got a couple of announcements we want to make here. Uh, we've got outreach uh, down at Midtown Mall, uh, kicking up at 6.30 p.m., so I can encourage you, church. Uh, please come out, because I'm going to know what we're called to be soul seekers in this city. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, continue to keep Pastor and Tash in your prayers um, as they're down at that conference. Uh, be praying that God would speak to them throughout this conference, that God would, would encourage them, would, would uh, help them to come back with a, a fresh fire for God. Uh, be praying for uh, me and Lindsay. We've got our wedding uh, coming up very soon. Uh, very excited for that. Uh, be keeping our families uh, in your prayers, uh, praying that God would, would speak to them. At our wedding, praying that family members will get saved. Uh, we've also got men's need next Monday. So for the men, if I can encourage you, me and Jordan will be um, heading down to her school. So if you, you're free that night, I'd encourage you to go um, come out. Uh, come out to our men's need. Uh, it's going to be led by Pastor Monzone. Uh, that's all of our announcements for tonight. Uh, let's welcome up the ushers as we uh, get into God's community. Just a simple encouragement, church. Uh, we want to honor God in our, in our tithes and offerings, all right? Because how many know that what you give into God's kingdom, God will bless you. Yes. And then, so why don't, we, why don't we do that tonight? Let's, let's give into God's kingdom, and I'm going to get Jordan to uh, pray over the gift and giver. Yes, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, that we can invest into your kingdom. I'm asking God, help us to give with a heart of gratitude. Lord, knowing that our investments will go towards the souls of men and women, God. Lord, help us, Lord. Bless the gift and give it tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. All right, church. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we have the privilege of having uh, Jared uh, from, from her school uh, coming out to share his uh, his story, share his testimony with us here tonight. Uh, this brother of ours, he, he got saved back on uh, the 31st of March, back in 2021. Got invited out to a concert, uh, repented, uh, got saved. And now uh, he's, uh, he's a married man, uh, faithful. He's uh, firming, serving faithfully down at Hurstville. Yes. So why don't we welcome him up as he makes his way forward. Yes. Thanks for that, Billy, really, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for having us, guys. Uh, it's a blessing. I want to thank Pastor Adrian, if he's watching on the live stream, for this opportunity. Also, thank my pastor uh, for sending me here tonight. And I hope that I can relate to some of your lives here tonight. Um, so I want to start tonight with my childhood. And um, can I just get that first photo, please? And um, growing up, 
my dad was in the picture, and um, I have a twin brother, and um, it's hard to tell which one's the cuter one. But, uh, it was a tough time. Um, I was born here in Sydney. One of my earliest memories is having breakfast with my mum and my brother, and um, I was waiting for my dad to get home, and uh, I spoke to uh, my mum, and I, was, I told her, I was like, Mum, uh, is dad gonna be home anytime soon? And she goes, yeah, he should be here soon. If you want to go downstairs and wait with him, I'll wait for him. And uh, my, my brother and I, we went downstairs and uh, we were down there for hours and uh, I turned and looked at my brother and I was like, oh, where is this guy? And um, we decided to go back upstairs and we found out that he wasn't coming back. And um, that was a very tough time in my life. I was about five years old here in this picture, four, about four or five, maybe a bit younger, not too sure. But um, who can relate tonight that uh, people growing up in a fatherless household um, I was broken from this and started to suffer from rejection and self-esteem issues. I always wanted to play rugby growing up. And my mum was afraid that I would get hurt and um, so she decided to put me in a whole bunch of different sports, uh, soccer and all that boring stuff. Um, you're soccer fan, you know. <laughs> about the origin. Um, at about 9, 10, I finally started to play footy. Uh, a few of the coaches saw potential in me, and um, I got selected to play for the St. George Development Squad. Uh, that was a, one of the highlights in my childhood, and um, I was successfully going well in football, and um, I ended up starting to hang around the wrong people. Um, I hit high school, um, but in primary school, I was a good kid, you know, I was in school council, I was a school prefect, um, I had it. I thought I was going in the right direction, and I had it all going. My mum, uh, she done the best that she could while I was growing up. Um, when I started, I, I turned twelve and went to year seven, and um, started to hang around different people. It was a different atmosphere, different crowd, and I thought, oh, this is new to me. This is different. And um, immediately, I started to go in a different direction. Um, I started to hang around with cool kids at school. Um, I started to get involved in what they were doing, which was smoking and. Uh, getting involved in drugs and um, drinking alcohol and uh, leaving and we call jigging school. Um, I started to rebel against my mum at this stage. I started to steal from her because um, my mum always smoked growing up but I never really thought that I would get into it. And then I started to steal from her. I started to steal cigarettes. I started to steal alcohol. I started to steal money from her purse to get what I wanted to look cool in front of everyone else. Uh, but shortly after that, I decided to start jigging school and leaving, and um, I ended up getting caught stealing at one of the local shops. Um, and the security guard grabbed me, and um, I, was a, I had handcuffs on, and I was in the back of the shop, and he called my mum, and then this, uh, the cops come down, and they called my mum, and they told her what happened, and my mum come, picked me up, and it was a very stressful time for my mum. She started to cry, and she's like, oh, I didn't expect this from you, this isn't who you are, this isn't who you were. And, um, but deep down I was trying to rebel, I was trying to be someone that I wasn't. And um, so I got charged for the first time for stealing. And shortly after that I was worried what my mum would think, so I decided to run away. And I thought this is the best thing that I can do, I run away if she doesn't want me. Um, I don't want her, I want to try and do what I wanted. Like, if I run away, I could do whatever I want. Um, but a week later, it didn't work out for me and I got caught stealing again. And I got my second charge. And at this point in my life, I started to feel the rush. I started to feel, uh, have a vibe for stealing, have a vibe for getting into crime. And um, I thought I was the man. And um, I stopped going to footy training to party and smoke drugs. I started getting involved in worse and worse things, but my mum finally had enough. And we had an argument. Uh, I started to punch walls, I started to scream, I started to verbally abuse my mum. I started to uh, physically demand things. Uh, and I thought that's, because growing up without a father, I thought that's what a man does. I thought uh, you make a name for yourself, you be dominant. And, um, Shortly after that, my mum kicked me out. Um, always 
had a thing where I was always trying to push away the people that loved me. And um, she called the cops and um, she put an ADO on me. And uh, that was my third charge, my third caution down the drain. And I ended up spending my first night in a detention center. Uh, that's actually Reby Juvenile Detention Center, which is about 10 minutes down the road from here. And um, I remember this time, and I remember being in this jail cell, it's dark, it's quiet, uh, hearing people scream and slide things under the doors, and it was, it was, a, it was wild, it was a mess. And, um, but I, I started to like that, I started to like that, that adrenaline rush that was going through me. And um, shortly after that, I uh, got out of uh, jail, um, I started to get a feel for that, I started to join the rush, I started to get into fights, and um, I ended up meeting a whole bunch of guys, just like myself, on the street, and um, they used to get involved in the same things, or come from broken homes, rejected families, uh, they all wanted to do what was best for them, they wanted to be their own person, and we'd have like, maybe it was like 30 to 50 people like just sitting there at the Hurstful Fountains, and uh, we'd be punching on, and uh, getting involved in street gangs, and uh, we thought this was normal. We thought stealing was how you make a life. We thought bashing people was a way to go. We thought if someone looked at you wrong, that you just have to show them what's up. Um, so I started to push away everyone, and um, I started short, 14 years old. I started to jo I joined a street gang, and shortly after that, I started to sell drugs. Um, as a 14 year old kid, I was broken, and um, I thought, this is my life, this is what I'm gonna do. And, uh, I started to love the life, but hate myself. Slowly I was eating away in my flesh, using heavier drugs that I couldn't handle. Um, I had my first um, overdose not long after that. And I'm in the park and with my mates and I'm there smoking heavier drugs and this time it's getting worse and I'm there at the park and I'm looking right at these drugs and I have too much and I drop to the floor and I start having a seizure and my mates thought I was joking, they start kicking me, they start um, being fools because they thought I was joking but I was having a seizure. The next day I woke up in hospital, I survived this overdose uh, a couple of days later, my mate's younger brother, um, my mum was crying and I started to understand that I was an addict and I was addicted to these drugs. I didn't know how I was, I didn't know how to escape and just kept getting involved in the same things over and over again. After years of selling drugs, it finally caught up on us. Um, I was sitting in the garage at my friend's house. Um, we're smoking drugs, we're getting high, we're getting involved in all these things and three guys rush in the garage and um, I just remember the, the moment, it was loud, and, uh, it was quick but this guy come in and he had a gun and he pointed it straight at my head and um, at this moment of time I'm just like, what am I going to do and I froze and another guy come in and he pulled out a machete about this long and um, they wanted to take our drugs, they wanted to... Um, come and do what they was coming to do. But um, they didn't get anything, but who knows that if you were to be in a moment like this, that you'd, be, you'd want to snap out of the lifestyle that you're living, you'd be like, I wanna change from this. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the case and um, I didn't do that and continue doing what I was doing. A couple of days later, uh, my mate's younger brother, he because um, we got him to start selling drugs for us and he ended up getting robbed as well and he said that the guys were just up the street and um, just filled with anger and rage towards these people. We got up and uh, we'd done what these guys done to us. We got up, we grabbed our baseball bats and our knives and everything we had and we ran up the street to get this guy and um, there was him and his few mates there. I remember just confronting him and the face that he had, that he was scared, that he didn't know what he was doing and he was saying sorry, but we just didn't care, we were full of rage and anger. And um, I had this knife and I just remember just looking at this guy and just spiding kicking him and he fell over and we just had a brawl with about, it was like him and five other guys and we ended up beating these guys up. 
And um, that was something I was used to. And um, I was over my life at this point. And I was over doing the same things over and over again. And um, I decided that I, I didn't want to do it anymore. And um, I got drunk and I decided that I wanted to kill myself and um, I went to plan suicide. And um, I went to jump in front of a bus and um, lucky for me, a, a mate was there walking by and then he tackled me out of the way and I survived again this time. I turned 18 years old and um, I got arrested again. And um, if you could play that video, please. I got arrested again, but this time it was different because I've done this over and over again. And um, by the time, by the time I was 16 years old, I had already been to jail over 10 times, seen many friends overdose, and spent over a year and a half of my life in prison. And now that I'm 18, I'm I'm used to this. I'm used to this lifestyle. I'm used to the way that I'm living, I'm used to the people that I'm hurting, the people that I'm pushing away, the drugs I'm using, the alcohol I'm consuming. And um, here I ended up going to jail, but this time it was adult jail. And um, I could just remember how scared I was. Um, I was a young guy, and um, just get that photo, please, the jail photo. And um, young guy in jail, in prison, and I was like 55 kilos. And, um, I hadn't had a haircut in weeks, and um, I was living in a trap house, and I was doing all these things, but I go to this, I'm like, what's going to happen between now? I'm in the back of the cop car, and I'm like, wow, uh, this is real. Like, I've gone to, like, kid jail, like, juvenile all these years, but this time it's actually, it's real, and it's hitting me. Um, so I hit prison at 18 years old, and um, I slowly started to get used to these things, and I show this photo because I want to show that this is a real life story. And that this is how many people grow up with fatherless homes. Um, this is how many people grow up if they want um, to change in their life, if they've grown with absent dads, with rejection issues, and things that these people go through. But I spent 12 months in prison for an aggravated robbery and company. And um, during this time, one of my first few nights in jail, I seen. Um, I was going to bed early because I had called the next day and um, I woke up, not for court, but half my, um, half my jail cell was on fire and I was like, what, what's going on right now? Why is my, what, this isn't normal, right? And, um, but I just remember grabbing a jumper that was close to me and I wrapped it around my head and um, I started like banging on the doors and um, I was like to the officer, I was like, open the door, open the door. And they come and they open the door and then they're like, was it you? And I'm like, what do you mean it was me? I'm like, like there's a fire going on right now, let me out of here. And um, but they closed the door back on me and I was like, oh, and I was freaking out. At this moment of time, I freaked out. And um, about a couple, like, you know, it felt like five minutes, but it was probably like 30 seconds. <laughs> um, they opened the door again and they let me out. But these were only one of the experiences that I experienced in jail. And, I've seen uh, people get raped, I've seen uh, people get stabbed, I've seen people get bashed to death, I've seen many, many things, people using drugs and shooting up, and um, this was not even half of it. Uh, but for an 18 year old kid, um, first time into this world, it's, it was different for me. Um, I've seen a lot as a child, but this was different and it changed who I was as a person. But I got out and I still returned to do what I was doing in four weeks. I've done 12 months and I got out for four weeks and then I went back in for a fight. Done another seven months, I got out for five weeks and I went back in for another fight. I've done another six months altogether. I've done 25 months in prison. I was only out for about nine weeks and this is how I wanted to live. This is, I didn't feel like I was wasting any time at the moment. I didn't feel like I was, uh, doing anything that I shouldn't, but that's what I wanted to do. But I finally got out after all this, all this time and all together I spent uh, between 13 and 
21, I spent five years of my life in prison. I spent five years locked up in and out of prison, in and out of jail. Um, and I imagine how hard that would have been for my mum. How hard that would have been for the people that cared for me. But I just wanted to push them away. I wanted to kill my emotions. I wanted to make a resume for myself where everyone looks at this guy. He's like, this guy's heartless. This guy doesn't care what happens. And in the deep end, that kicked me. Because when things got real, no one was there for me. Mm. Over five years of my life, no one visited me in jail. Um, no one even cared or sent me a letter. Nobody done anything. I'd just get out and I'd hang around the same people and I'd be there for the vibe. But when I was in the down, they wouldn't be there. And um, I didn't see that at the time. But now it's a different story. Uh, shortly, when I got released, I got invited to, to church, to a concert. Um, let me get that photo, please. And um, I went to this concert, and um, my life changed dramatically. <coughs> and um, I come from these gangs and um, hang around with drugs and alcohol. And this was different for me. I've been invited plenty of times before to concerts and to church services, but I was always stoned, or I was with my mates, and they were laughing at me, or they were laughing at the situation, or I was laughing. And um, I didn't really care for that at that stage in my life. But this time when I got invited, I felt something different and I wanted to be there. And um, I went to this concert and it was a whole different atmosphere. Uh, I can't remember what they were doing that night, but um, <laughs> I feel the vibe still to this day. And um, I was surrounded by nice people and I was like, where is this place? Is this? <laughs> But, um, <laughs> um, but at the end of the concert, the pastor, he said something called an altar call. And at that stage, I had no idea. And I heard all these people speaking out in tongues and all these things going on. And I'm like, what is this? And, um, but God spoke to me. And I felt my heart, like, I felt like my heart was about to come out of my chest. It was pounding and pounding faster and faster. The pastor's talking about sin, how it separates us from God. And he's talking about how Jesus died on the cross for our, for our sin, that we could be right with God, and that heaven will be our home if we repent. And um, I felt the conviction, my heart was pumping. And he asked, do you want to raise your hand if you want to get right with God? And um, I rose my hand, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ on the 31st of March, 2021. And um, shortly after this, my life, began to change. It began to turn from this person that was in and out of prison, that was uh, in and out of drugs, uh, in and out of consuming alcohol, getting involved in the things that I was doing. Um, I, but when I became a Christian, my mom had a different heart. And um, I thought that she'd be happy. She'd be like, oh yes, I'm gonna get my life on track. I'm gonna change. I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna stop drugs. I'm gonna stop alcohol. But, just before that, I, when I was selling drugs, I got my mum back on the drugs and she started to use pot. And so she'd always buy off me, but when I become a Christian, I stopped selling. And she got really offended at that, that she couldn't get drugs anymore. And um, she had a rage and she kicked me out of the house um, when I become a Christian. And um, I didn't know what to do, what I was gonna do in this stage. But um, I spoke to pastor and um, I got an opportunity to stay at the back of Pastor Luke who's now in uh, Henderson, New Zealand. I got the opportunity to stay at his house in the back of a uh, renovated granny flat with a couple of the boys. And um, I was used to this kind of living. You know, I'm used to cellmates, I'm used to uh, living with four other guys and doing what we had to do. But um, this was different because this was filled with love. Mm -hmm. And um, these guys actually cared for me. It's not like these other guys who were just there in the moment. It's not like these guys that when you're having a rough time in your life that they're gone, that they're out the window, and they're catching the next bus. But um, this was different because when I fell, these guys helped me. They picked me up. And um, I got handed my first Bible and a um, miracle in my life. And um, can we just check, uh, show the photos of me when I was getting involved in gangs? And uh, the other one. Yeah, these ones, and this is a broken man. This is a guy who was always trying to do stuff on the outside, 
uh, to please people. And um, that's who I thought I was going to be. But God had bigger plans. Amen. And um, being in this boys' house, we called it the Hilton. And there was no idea if you know the Hilton Hotel, there was no idea the Hilton. But um, sometimes I described it that I was living better in jail. But it was better than jail. It was better than living that life, that life that I was used to because I had the joy. I had the real joy. And um, I finally had the strength to get off the drugs. My body language started to change. And in the Bible, it talks about that as being reborn. And um, I started to get understanding and my life changed um, but it's not over my friend who invited me to church um, side of our side of my walk she was struggling and um, she started backsliding and um, I didn't know much about God so we nearly left church she went uh, to what she thought would be her last service and I stayed at home and we were about to leave church <laughs> But God spoke to me again and said no. So I told her that I'm going to stay and that you're going to stay too. Mm -hmm. And that we stopped talking and we got right with God. And um, six months later, we started to date. And uh, three months later, we got engaged. Cool. And um, my life to this point leading up to is a miracle. Because mm -hmm. I was all, through all these toxic relationships, through all these ups and downs in my life to being um, 21 and engaged and uh, it was totally different for me and for my wife now. About three months later from getting engaged we got married and um, what the enemy used for evil God turned that for good. Yes. We are now serving in church out of sin living our best life. I reunited with my father and my brother and sister for the first time. And I just remember the look on my sister's face. I've never met her in my life. Wow. And she looks at me with joy and she's like, Joan. And I'm just like, what? She jumps on me. And she's probably about seven years old. Yeah. And um, you see her here, she's just holding on to me. And the moment that I was going to go, she started crying. And um, I felt the pain in me because I grew up like this. I grew up um, rejected. I grew up with self-esteem issues. I grew up um, thinking that I was going to be left behind. But I reunited with my father and I realised that my father never left me. Mm -hmm. That God was always there. God was always helping me, our Father in Heaven. Amen. Shortly after that, my brother got saved. Amen. And uh, he got powerfully touched. And um, quickly he started getting... Uh, the feel with God and started street preaching and getting into it. Not long ago, um, he actually, he's left church now, but I'm praying for him and he's going to be back soon. Yes. But um, what I've realized that over this story that I'm showing you tonight, that all of this happened because I trusted in God when he told me to repent and get right with God. Yes. All of this happened because of one decision, one choice in my life. And growing up, a rejected home, rejected household, uh, growing up with my mum, always thinking that she was telling me what to do, me uh, rebelling and going in a different direction, uh, choosing a path that I wanted to choose, um, getting involved in uh, worse people in my life and started to get involved in gangs, in drugs, consuming alcohol, <coughs> in school, started stealing, uh, all of this to, um, I thought that I was being who I was, but that's not who I was, and I was trying to escape, but I didn't know how to escape, and the only way I found an escape was with Jesus Christ, yes. and um, this is my story, and I'm, I'm glad and thankful that you could all come out tonight, and I hope that you could relate to my story tonight, um, can I get everyone to bow their head please, and close your eyes, me growing up, and I want to thank you again for coming out, but growing up I had rejection issues. I had self-esteem issues, and I thought this is who I wanted to be. I thought I, uh, thought this is how I was going to be in life, and I always tried hurting the people closest to me. And maybe you've been in a situation like this. Maybe you've grown up in a broken home. Maybe you've grown up with a loved one walking out on you. 
men who've grown up getting involved in drugs, consuming alcohol, getting involved with gangs, going to jail, to prison, trying to escape it, trying to escape a life that you didn't think you could escape. But what if I told you tonight that there is one way, and that way is Jesus Christ? <clears throat> that by repenting, that by getting right with God, that everything can change with one decision. That God sent His only begotten Son into this world, and He died on the cross, a painful death at Calvary for our sin. And I want to ask anyone tonight that if they're living in sin, that they want to get right with God, that if you felt the same conviction that I felt, the tugging on your heart, the pounding on your heart, that you have sin in your life and you want to repent, can I get an uplifted hand, please, in this place? I want to ask if you have sin in your life, if you want to get right with God, can I see an uplifted hand in this place? From left to right, from back to front, I'm not going to hold this call much longer. <coughs> but I want to thank everyone for coming out and I want to turn the call to backsliders. You once had a relationship with God, but you've slowly backed off and you've gone in a different direction. I want to tell you that there is hope here tonight, backslider. I want to let you know that there is a different direction, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And believe that everyone is saved here tonight. I want to thank everyone for coming out. I want to change the call, Christians. But if we can come to the altar tonight, that if we can start praying to God and we can ask God for His forgiveness. Amen. The altars are open here tonight. <coughs> oh, hallelujah. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that we can come here tonight. God, that we can hear from you. God, that you can move supernaturally in our lives. God, that you can use my testimony, God, for a purpose. God, that people can relate to that. God, we pray, Lord, you move supernaturally in everyone's hearts here tonight. God, we pray, God, for a Holy Ghost moment. We pray, Lord, for your anointing. We pray, God, for the Holy Fire in this place. Oh, God, for you are worthy. For you are mighty, oh, God. Oh, hallelujah. And we are grateful that you are with us every step of the way. You are the way, the truth, and the life, Father. And we are grateful, God, that we have been given a second chance in life. That we can repent, that we can get right by you. God, we thank you for the cross. <coughs> we thank you for your love, God. And we pray, God, that you move in everyone's life here this week. God, we pray a blessing over everyone here tonight. Hallelujah, for you are worthy, God. Oh, send it in your son, no, 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 asanda, da, ba, 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 ro, bo, bo. Oh, worthy is your name, God. Oh, thank you, God. Can you play a song, please? Oh, send it in your son, da, da, ba, 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 ro, bo, 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 Praying tonight, can you stand up, please? We're going to sing a song of worship.
Jared for, for coming out tonight, be encouraged yes. uh, by his testimony that he shared. Um, please, uh, if I can encourage him again, uh, we've got outreach tomorrow, 6.30 p.m. at Minto Mall. So uh, please come out. Me and, uh, if you need any um, any any of the deeds, uh, please feel free to hit me or Jordan up. Uh, but yeah, let's let's close off in prayer. Uh, I've got to get Jordan to uh, close us off. Yes, Heavenly Father, we thank you here tonight, God, that you've have the power to change lives. We thank you for the life of our brother Jared, God. I'm asking help us leave you encouraged, equipped, Lord, knowing that you are in control when we don't see it, God. I'm asking God, use us to be messengers of the truth and the gospel, Lord. Use us tomorrow under outreach. Keep us safe in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Excuse me. <laughs> Please turn up.